and I hope all of you have, uh, have, 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 enjoy, have enjoyed lunch on this uh, bright afternoon. And we can get started with uh, the panel, uh, Alternative Governance Models, Making It Happen. And uh, there's uh, the, the order in the, for some reason, the, the order in the program book is not the same as the order uh, that you see here, but we'll be following uh, that order. Uh, with Anya, uh, Jan, 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 and Jill. Now, uh, these, uh, these are three uh, amazingly accomplished people, and they're so accomplished that rather than, try to, ra rather than try to repeat all their accomplishments, I simply direct you to the program. And uh, you know, one of the things that people say uh, is so good about cities is that uh, innovations travel in cities very quickly. So I really loved uh, Anna Maria's innovation in terms of the question, you know, in terms of the, uh, of the questions. Uh, so I'm going to, to uh, after the three, after the three uh, uh, speakers have, pre have presented their work, I'm again going to ask you to kind of form yourselves into, into these little groups uh, to come up with, you know, to come up with a question uh, and present it, present it to the group. And, you know, furthering this idea of innovation, uh, I also liked uh, Lester's uh, way of asking for three questions at once so we can, you know, get the questions on the table quickly. Uh, so, uh, with that, with that, with that preface, uh, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to call on my my colleague uh, Anya Sirota. I think I'm in charge here. I just move it right along. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of this conference. It's been a very inspiring conversation. I know we're after lunch, so we're going to keep this conversation very, very light. Um, it's coming not from geography or planning, uh, but from the direction of design. And so um, that comes with its own set of challenges in talking about urban conditions and its own set of experiments. And I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to unpack those together. Uh, the name of the talk is In Land We Trust. And as has been discussed earlier, uh, there's a difference between land and property. And I'm hoping that in this short conversation, we'll be able to unpack it a little bit further. Uh, to introduce my own practice, Sako Aiki, that has been operating in Detroit for the last five, six years, um, we work very hard to create a distinct synthesis of aesthetics, activism, social enterprise, and cultural programming. In all of our projects, we're exploring ways that architecture can frontally engage the material realities of place and make difference, make change, and participate in public discourse. We sometimes create parallel institutions, as in this case, a clip-on architectural symbol to galvanize participation in disarmed cultural conditions. For the case of Detroit, the Arts Council was cut long before the bankruptcy of the city. And so we designed, in collaboration with artists in Detroit, a kind of ephemeral or ethereal architecture uh, conceived to attach to vacant spaces and start conversations about the future of an institution and what shape it might take in Detroit. We create scenographic constructs when normative cultural infrastructure might be missing or invisibilized. And more recently, we have been working to address questions of commoning at urban scales. We're currently working on the urban design for the unification strategy of Detroit's cultural district, bringing together institutions from, fordable, that, uh, from formidable uh, cultural venues like the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, the DIA, the Detroit Public Library, the Michigan Science Center, but smaller institutions such as the Hellenic Museum, the Carr Center, and seeing how a collective, common, uh, shared landscape might create legibility and inclusivity in the city. In all of our experiences working in Detroit, one thing we found incredibly striking. With over 17% of Detroit's land currently vacant and about 20% held by the land bank, uh, 
there are no land trusts operating in Detroit. And so I know there was a conversation about organizations that are encouraging land trusts to begin operating in Detroit. And those are efforts that are creating interest, creating community engagement, but as of now, no land trust operates in Detroit. The work that we do in neighborhoods, which we sometimes consider micro-utopian urbanisms, is not entirely unique. Our projects are single instances that belong to a broad network of ecosystems that also produce their own visions, their own aspirations toward micro-utopian urbanisms or emergent urbanisms that attempt to answer questions around cultural autonomy, infrastructural stewardship, and the chimerical production of joy in complex socioeconomic scenarios. Yet with so many efforts to create uh, organizations and organizational paradigms for alternative urbanisms, a dearth of collective, alternately managed commons currently exists in Detroit. We've tried to understand and unpack some of the reasons or challenges for creating commons in Detroit. And the first in what we is something that we understand as a perceptual challenge. In arguably the most modern of cities, the inventor of the Ford Fortis Taylorist mode of industrial production, the streamlining of automation on the factory floor, the first free span um, factory and first enforced concrete floor, and the first depressed highway, home ownership in this context is a modern right and a modern aspiration. The cultural issue of home ownership cannot be underestimated in Detroit. Before the subprime mortgage crisis, Detroit enjoyed one of the nation's highest rates of home ownership. Only in Detroit did African American home ownership rates almost approach white national home ownership rates, both hovering a little bit over 50% before the crisis, that is. The percentage of African American home ownership dropped dramatically in Detroit after the crisis, down to 40%, just uh, over half, um, just a little bit over 40% in 2000, according to reports. So in a city that traditionally ran on middle class aspirations for all, the land trust model, the model where the land belongs to a collective ethos of governance, that is something that offers psychological challenges, especially in African American communities where land ownership operates as an important proxy for freedom. The challenges of this new uh, organizational paradigm surfaces almost immediately. Another challenge to alternate modes of land management may be embedded in the funding mechanisms that support creative practices uniquely poised to imagine new urban morphologies. A few years back in 2012, I worked on the Culture Now Project, a multi-institutional research project la launched in 2011 by UCLA, which included the University of Michigan, among other institutions, in the Rust Belt. And it, we produced this diagram to describe um, how much of our um, federal budget is spent on the arts. So DOT, we have HUD money, we have the EPA, and there's a little bit, there's a little bit of funding that's allotted to the NEA. And when we zoom in closer to this diagram, that dot still remains invisible. If we look at how much we spend per capita around this time, this is also 2012, so these numbers are actually drastically sadder now. Uh, but in 2012, we spent uh, 2.5 billion of federal funding on arts, uh, which ended up being about $11 per capita. So we were spending something like the Ukraine and Romania on uh, federal funding dollars for the arts, compared to, for example, France, which has a robust history of um, producing federally funded artworks and practices. Now, what we uh, see as a dearth of funding uh, from federal resources then is made up by the incredible uh, funding that uh, emerges from philanthropic uh, sources. This number again has grown, so 4% in 2012 uh, of philanthropic money uh, was dedicated to arts, culture, and humanities. That number is up to 5%. And so when we look at how much money is being spent through foundation dollars, we begin to, to equalize or to spend in, in, um, in proportion to European countries. In Detroit, 
arts funding between 2010 and 2020 represented over 83 uh, million dollars. And these are some of the, the organizations that, sort of, that have, have dedicated the most resources to arts funding in the city, including the William Davidson Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, Knight, and Art Place. If we look at the Knight Foundation, for example, as a, a series of resources, most of the funding, after all, has been uh, given to institutions, uh, to large organizations, such as the DIA, et cetera. But over the course of a few years, between 2012 and uh, 2018, there was a trend where uh, the foundations were beginning to fund small community organizations and their arts-driven initiatives. If we look at a map of Art Place America, which uh, is a placemaking effort that aggregates resources from 16 different foundations and um, giving institutions with the mission of bringing community-generated arts to conversations on planning and, and redevelopment, we see that we can begin to map some of the resources that became available over the course of six years in Detroit to projects that were mostly community-based, in some cases very large, so we do see the DIA receiving uh, some funding, but overall we begin to see an ecosystem emerge where funding is, um, is, is uh, imagined as a generative mode of equitable uh, development. And so we also see a narrative issue emerging from the, the foundation dollars that have um, flooded Detroit and its ecosystem of arts production, which is a kind of heroicist uh, narrative, one where visionary artists are capable of instigating change, of invigorating communities, and galvanizing common good. Now, foundations in all of this, in this scenario, they're still, in, they're still um, investment strategies. These are non-democratic processes supported and engendered by tax dollars that have been offset to carry out the mission of a particular organization with their own social, economic, urban agendas attached to very specific investment portfolios. That said, for the duration of five or six years, we too positioned ourselves as an arts practice invested in equitable regeneration in Detroit. And we took part in you know, rebuilding vacant spaces, creating arts organizations, uh, mediatizing some of our interventions to tell stories and narratives about context and place, uh, creating scenarios for community engagement and, and planning, and very quickly, almost a few years into the process, uh, in particular with a project that we called One Mile Detroit, or the Oakland North End Detroit Project, we began to recognize that certain aspects of our project were creating changes in the landscape, changes that we hadn't really anticipated or um, were prepared to mitigate. So for example, six months into opening a, a garage space that was used as an informal uh, space for cultural production and creation, a friend of mine sent me this uh, Craigslist uh, advertisement for, I think it's like a three-bedroom apartment that has nice floors and lots of light, but what struck me was that this place, this is near an artist's colonies, studios, walking distance to the light rail, a co and coming dog park, and within, one, within the one-mile project area, urban farms, pop-up warehouses, raves, this, this hotspot is only getting better. And so inadvertently, while our project didn't own any land, it didn't own any properties, we were beginning to, um, to kindle and enable uh, modes of gentrification in the neighborhood because we hadn't planned ahead for the impact that we were making inadvertently. So learning from, from these uh, processes and invariably mistakes, we imagined ways that architects might work in these conditions with alternate strategies. We began to work with the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm, which is also a project that we uh, have been involved in, in in Detroit for a number of years. And the first thing that we looked at was uh, the property available through the land bank um, and what was available to the organization as an asset for creating alternate urban environments and morphologies. And then we happened to, to meet uh, Joshua Ackers, who you just heard from, and uh, we learned about his work with, uh, with Praxis and the way that he was thinking about speculation 
as a, 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 a nemesis to equitable redevelopment in the city and as a challenge for equitable redevelopment in the city. And we were very struck by the depth and uh, perception of his work, and we thought, would it be possible to learn from some of the speculator types that he had um, included in his research, but to hack them, to, to uh, use them as tools for equitable re regeneration and communal um, assessment. So we looked at some of his work. We tried to diagram what he was describing as methods for speculator um, engagement in communities. And we began to think about ways that architects and residents might emulate, replicate, and then divert resources using the same techniques that speculators use in Detroit. And so what we did was we created a network of what we termed uh, naively moral investors. And we began to play the auction, the land bank auction, collectively. So we would sit in one room and we would use some of the techniques that other speculators used. So for example, we would purchase every fifth lot uh, secretly while uh, making sure that we weren't bringing the prices up and we were never betting on the same lot. And then at the end of that process, we would gift all of the land to the farm. This went on for two years. We used the side lot program as well. So after we purchased a lot, we gifted it to the farm. We would purchase the side lot, gift it to the farm. At the same time, we were developing an image for the farm, one that wasn't just about bringing the, the farm back to a productive landscape, but one that was exuberant about its cultural value. We were looking at the way the landscape was being used, and we ended up coming up with a master plan that uh, incorporated six acres of land that we were able to bring together into what we were hoping would one day become a civic commons. In this model, what you see are the buildings that belong to this plan, that belong to the Oakland Avenue urban farm, and then the black stuff around, it actually doesn't exist. It's our conceptual idea about um, corporate investment marching on. It's something that we can't control. There's only so much of the landscape that we can be involved in. And then we have to take into account that other forces are also at play in, um, in the landscape and in the community. And so we looked at ways that we could repurpose every one of the buildings on site. We looked at ways that we could partner with private owners and imagine ways to recuperate some of these buildings for public uses, but then you know, create Airbnb units on top so that they could pay for the public programming below. We looked at ways that we could re recalibrate and reactivate um, historical buildings like Red's Jazz Shoeshine, uh, which used to be a speakeasy and a shoeshine parlor. And so we worked with artists um, in, the, in the music scene, in the vanguard music scene, to imagine programming for that space as well. And we Im imagined creating a hostel that would also create uh, economic opportunities for uh, people at the farm uh, to be able to stabilize and create a sustainable economic system. And in all these cases, we designed down to the wallpaper aspects of the, the space that would tell stories and narratives about the context. So for example, this is wallpaper that we designed um, where the flora and fauna are conceived as uh, automobile parts, admitting that the farming scene in Detroit is not about um, homesteading or a return to the land. It's about the reality of transforming one industrial use into potentially another. When we finally were able to um, stabilize and purchase a vast majority of the, of the land in this plan, we held uh, meetings and parties and engagement activities in order to communicate the aspirations of this project to a broader audience and to create buy-in into the idea of creating Detroit's first land trust in the North End. And so to make all of this happen, we don't work alone. Uh, we work with the Detroit Justice Center, in particular Eric Williams, who's an amazing legal advocate. And we've been working also with Bill Lovejoy from uh, the Associate Dean at Ross Business School to envision a uh, collective, equitable, and engaged system. And of course, uh, it would be impossible without our partners at the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm, and especially Jerry Hebron, the director of this experimental collective effort. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, when we started a conceptual work on um, a competition which was uh, aiming on enlarging the view on the new uh, regional plan for the rural area, um, we came across a discourse which is probably very well known with uh, many others post-industrial landscapes. So that post-industrial landscapes are non-innovative environments, basically because uh, they are monostructural, they have monostructural economics, uh, no diversity, and they have a kind of unskilled worker structure which is not able to adapt. Beyond that, we had the task to deal with the spatial structure of the rule. And um, therefore, we asked ourselves whether there are patterns, institutional and spatial, and past dependencies which are actually generating a kind of top-down model dependency in, um, in a post-industrial area, which are preventing bottom-up um, activities to rise and, and to influence uh, the development. And the results of this I would like to share with you. And I would like to end up with a postscript, which is actually the picture that we created for uh, the competition, not as a solution, but as a contribution. And we we'll share with you the difficult situation that the rural area is actually still uh, facing uh, with uh, the process of the uh, creating of, of its own uh, regional plan. So this is the rule in the year 1840, just at the start of the industrialization. And the point is here that the, the area of 70 to 40 kilometers, which would probably be something like 50 to 30 miles, had only five cities, which could be called cities, altogether around 20,000 people living in. After 80 years, this changed into an area with 3.5 million people, which was laminary inhabited as a kind of carpet-like um, um, structure, uh, which was very strongly linked to the industry of mining, which needs distance between the mines, and the mines uh, attracted people, and the people created settlements. So, the basic structure developed in this way for more than a century and created a kind of landscape which is very scattered in terms of municipal institution institutionalization and very strongly linked as a machine, as a productive industrial machine by the productive sites and the infrastructures which made up up to six, uh, sorry, one sixth of, of the whole um, areas. Uh, of the whole area. And those sites actually are those which are not accessible for a long time and not accessible for normal people, just for the workers for their shifts. And those were also the sites, the only sites that were well planned. The, the way these sites were planned was a connection between the companies and the state. So the companies bought the rights to mine and to produce steel, and they got special improvement in planning in order to connect these sites with infrastructures. And in between, you again can find cities. Those cities had city rights, so they had a city parliament and they, with people who could vote. But most of them were arising on the old cities, on the five old cities, you can see them by the names, and some of them, new cities around it, they only account for a third of uh, the inhabitants um, by the beginning of the century. So two thirds of the inhabitants actually were not institutionalized in terms of being, uh, being um, somebody who is living in a city, has the right to vote, and has an access to a proper infrastructure, being it school infrastructure, being it technical infrastructure. And there, in this situation, there was actually no interest, no very strong interest uh, on the side of the uh, factories to change this, 
because they were interested in their own red line system here. There was no interest by the cities to incorporate these large, giant villages because it would produce costs. And there was also no political will to incorporate these areas because they was, or, or give them town rights because this would create an environment of voters which would have direct influence on the state politics. Even more, this area has been divided into three different planning regions out of five of the state. So this region until now has not been its own political planning region. And this competition that I'm talking about actually is one of the attempts to change that. So it was a long process, or it is a still ongoing process. And for the sake of this presentation, I have divided the process into four different phases. But they are overlapping. So how actually the region's development forced a kind of institutionalization or regionalization by itself. What actually happened is that with the very extensive uh, mining polders uh, occurred, and there was a need for a complex water management in the area. The marshlands became wet, and it wasn't possible for many areas to live in anymore. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we have passed, we have another, um, another illnesses which were evolving on many, many places in, uh, in the rural. So the first regionalization which was actually allowed was a combination um, of a, um, was a, uh, was an alliance of the cities, of the industries, and the state, which defined a huge infrastructural program to completely change the, 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 uh, the system of the irrigation and uh, sewage and uh, water systems by changing rivers into open sewages and completely changing the infrastructure, the water infrastructure and creating thousands of pumps which were pumping the water into these channels so the water comes out of the region. This was only possible to be done in a corporation which is regional because water doesn't know any borders, any uh, institutional borders. But the corporation as such was only based on the need to pump the water and to invest into the regional space. So as long as there was an investment, there was an interest into ruling the space, also outside of the cities and outside of the factories. The cities, which were become powerful by, uh, by this change, actually tried to, um, tried to create their own regional body, which would then come up for their interest, their own interest. And they clashed, of course, with the interest of the state and of the industries. This is the second regionalization, the, regional, uh, the, the region of a kind of residual space management. And this is the old original um, term for the Ruhr uh, Regional Association program, which evolved in uh, 1920. With, uh, with the establishment of the, of the regional association of the cities. This program was actually aiming on providing infrastructure, providing education, providing coordinated planning, but what actually remained was the plan or planning for areas in between the urbanized areas and the factories and the infrastructures. So those were the places of no corporate interest, those were the places where the cities were able to go further with the planning. So what the cities actually did, they created a system of green spaces, green corridors that would limit and in a way steer the regional development of, uh, of the urban areas. And so prevent from conflicts between the growing cities. These are the greens areas marked here and you see the, the core areas of the cities in between. So in 1920, the urbanized, non-urbanized area looked 
like the picture on the, on the upper level and the formalization of this actually is the picture that you see down there. The third regionalization, all, also bot, uh, not bottom up but top down, was a kind of regional brownfield management. So with the first coal crisis in 58 and the, the um, oil crisis in the 70s, actually there was a very, very strong decline in, um, in the mining and steel production. And all these infrastructure, the sixth um, of uh, the area, changed their use. Of, but of course, first, they started to be brownfields. And what happened then was that the state started to buy up these areas and to revitalize, to reinvest into these areas in order to refurbish them. In a contract between the companies which were then released from the burdens of, uh, of uh, refurbishment of these sites. This gave a possibility to start the quite famous international building exhibition which came up at the end of the, of the 80s, which created green spaces and corridors and which was based on the, uh, on the planning from the 1920s between the cities as a program to revitalize um, the, uh, the area and restructure the, the very core of this industrial area along the uh, Emscher River. You can see that in, in this picture that this was a very, very sophisticated plan. If you see the Emscher master plan, which is, uh, which is for the core area of around 40 kilometers length, um, it is 20 big fat books, if you print it, which are very detailed uh, indicating areas of action, all top-down finance from the, uh, from the state and, um, and uh, planned uh, by the regional bodies that I have mentioned in large, large projects. So those projects had very, very strong impact on the image and on the function of the region. And they also allowed the people to enter areas which were closed for them and to create a kind of regional awareness. This is one of the very iconic projects, the Iba Tetraeda in Botrop, but there are many, many of such projects. Um, on different scales. So changing the infrastructure in a kind of network of hundreds of installations, creating an environment which is, uh, is uh, people-friendly, changing the narrative of, of post-industrial into a kind of new modern space for living. Um, the IBA was very, um, very clever programmed um, it had, uh, and, and I, I'm often showing this slide for that because this project uh, of the sulfur iron is uniting three main, uh, main approaches for refurbishing spaces. First one is highlighting the history, a kind of highlight architecture. The other one is the reuse of space for other uses, and the next one is the giving back to the nature as we saw in the in the uh, greeneries. So this creates a, um, a spatial structure which is completely different from the industrial pictures that we have seen before. And as a picture from outside or on the regional level, which is in the interest of the state and of the companies which are, uh, which are refurbishing their, um, their estates or the regional bodies, this has a very strong effect on the, lo locative, um, on the location as such, so on the region. The question here is what is the impact for the communities which are just next to it? Okay, so if we would look into the detail, here you see the highlight in the middle, you see the green areas, areas which were the previous slag heaps, and you see brown fields, areas which are not yet developed. And um, you see the Senna building on the right, and on the upper level, you see areas which were actually dedicated for a, for a development which would give a step towards the, uh, the city around. 
okay, bring new businesses, bring new creative, uh, creative businesses and uh, new creative industries. These widely remained empty, and one of the critics on EBA would be that highlighting a certain project didn't help the communities which are around. Learning from EBA, there have been many, many successful projects um, in refurbishing uh, industrial sites, but there have been also many projects which were ignoring the community, the local communities, because they were thinking out of the regional level and not being nested in uh, the local level. So one example for that would be the Brookhausen revitalization area, where you have one of the last, uh, last steel factories which is producing very special steel, um, and a community which is very deprived, um, um, and in the revitalization concept of the city, there was the need to create a distance between this kind of still booming industry and get rid of areas which are actually very difficult to redevelop, especially very difficult to redevelop uh, top down. This neighborhood had a very uh, high percentage of, uh, of immigrants so it is kind of very, very weak neighborhood also in terms of uh, bottom-up movements. So what happened here was the redesign which was inspired by the tools of, uh, of the uh, landscape refurbishment, but which actually cut it the community into half and got rid of the most uh, difficult areas instead of redeveloping them. The fourth step which is for me a kind of change in this, uh, also because of its critique, was the European Capital of Culture in 2010. This again started with very, very large developments. This is the balloons showing each of the mines that have been existing in the last 100 years. This is a very strong, very powerful Pro project which closed the largest highway in the area and made it to a picnic table 70 kilometers long so the citizens can meet as citizens of the area. But what happened also already during the EBA was a kind of small development asking what actually is under this large development programs. What are the people doing in those in-between areas which are developed or forgotten? And there have been these Emscher uh, reports uh, which are interviewing people, asking them what they are doing there. There is a documentation of actions which were not documented yet in areas which have been uh, considered as abandoned. And slowly a concept how to make this area open, safe for development. And within this critiques on very large formats of a cultural, um, um, of cultural showdown during the uh, cultural capital, first groups were evolving, um, first groups started to evolve, which decided not to work for large projects, but we decided to nest into the communities and stay for long. One of them are the urbanists, uh, and I, uh, I have two more slides, sorry, um, which, um, which is a group also, um, also including students from our university, but also many, many other actors staying in a very deprived community in uh, Dortmund and taking the chance of building local capital for engagement when their site have been closed four years ago engage in the development of this site, engage with the city, engage with the region, engage with the investor. And the reason why there is a response now is actually that the top-down concept is not functioning anymore. It is only functioning when you change the hardware, but it's very difficult to use it for the software. So if you start to think about spaces of knowledge, urban production, cultural, educational quotas, quarters, and so you need this power from, uh, from uh, bottom up to get it done. So as a result, there is a huge influence now in this area for programming um, 
this area. My, my postscript, this is the very, very complicated system of, uh, the, uh, of creating the regional plan. What you, see, what you see on the upper level is the normal creation of a regional plan. So you have analysis, you have concept, you have approval. Under this, there is an idea competition. Under this, there is a discursive, um, discursive panel which is going through the municipalities, through the 57 municipalities. What we actually proposed was to go to the quarters, so not to create a regional plan which would be on cities, large infrastructure, one big rigid plan, but which would allow the communities along different quarters to live their own life and uh, to create an or environments. For example, by uh, providing some percentage of land for free for, uh, for any uh, experiments which are possible. What happens now is, that when the communities start to react on that, the cities are taking the power and are coming with their creative ideas, prolonging the process. So the, this plan should have been approved 2019. It will not be approved before 21. And the leader of the, of the process just lost his job because this is going too slow. This is how to show how difficult it is to include uh, bottom-up processes in a very top-down regulated post-industrial area. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I um, am going to talk in the beginning about a, a book project of ideas, um, and in the second half to unpack a couple of the ideas in relation to these questions of action and governance that this panel has been charged through, through um, a, a case study, a sort of present case study, but going back to its history to kind of understand what it means to take action and to um, engage governance. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience that property abandonment has long vexed cities, especially the architects, landscape architects, urban designers, planners, leaders, and citizens living and working in them. In the past few decades, hundreds of design ideas for abandoned property have emerged. Some are made purely speculative, while others have been tested and implemented. Meanwhile, neither the preoccupation with nor the accruement of abandoned property has abated. Um, I identify as one of these landscape architects, and for more than a uh, decade, I've been collecting and devising proper projects for abandoned property. I collect optimistically. I am an optimist at heart, and I have found hundreds of ideas for future landscapes that are possible, meaning that they've been proposed for a piece of formerly occupied land somewhere, sometime. Together, these ideas represent a case for a pause in the innate desire for building buildings. It is hard, naive, perhaps even dangerous, to suspend the dream of rebuilding on these lands. It's human nature to want to replace building with building. It's distress distressing to see the built environment dissolving, pulling economic resources and social support systems down in its wake. And it's tragic to li live in this midst. Um, but at the same time, it's rejuvenating to see the expansive sky allowed by open fields, to watch volunteer plants take root and grow tall, to allow water to infiltrate soils, to generate energy through climatic conditions, and to see animals and people at play, at work, at rest in the landscape. The people, the wildlife, and the land are embodied resources. These fallow landscapes um, are everywhere, and everywhere they are distinct. So my goal with this project, perhaps as we've talked about a little bit um, already today, is first to convey their idiosyncratic potentials uh, without display, uh, disclosing their hidden identities. In other words, a vacant property is not one thing by any means. I, I don't think I need to tell you that either. Um, and it's an attempt to look intently at the present lived condition as a reflection of a complex past in order to imagine equally rich and varied futures. Uh, so in many of these examples, it's a not a matter so much of making drastic changes to the sites themselves as drastically reimagining how we approach and manage them. Uh, so it's a projective collection. Um, 
that's dedicated to the fallow urban landscapes across North America, or at least um, the eastern half of North America, or eastern half of the US in this case, um, and to the people uh, working in this space. I, I owe it to sort of the collection of projects that kind of inspire me, um, that kind of recognizes that there's a beauty and limitation in ideas. Ideas are cheap, ideas are old, they're simple, they're impractical, they have baggage, they're specific, they evolve, they're fun, they're inspiring, they generate, uh, but in the end, they're just ideas. So these are just ideas, which rightly, in her afterward to the collection, the landscape architect, educator, and theorist, um, Julia Zerniak, asks, uh, what next? And she provides the following statement, I think one that very much aligns with the themes in this panel. What matters next is moving this project forward by navigating the relationship between precise design proposals and local policies, codes, development protocols, and financing mechanisms they must necessarily face. Working in within this triad of ambition to envision, to enable, to pay, will require a myriad of talent and expertise. I think that's why this, this kind of uh, symposium is, is great. Um, architects, landscape architects, planners, urbanists, graphic designers, real estate developers, leaders of not-for-profits, local government officials, and most notably, she says, the community, who knows so much about the history and legacy of their land. Through the agency of this group, we will move toward the assembly of what matters most, the collection of hundreds of once vacant sites that have fully and potentially realized their potential. Sounds great. Um, in his recent review of the collection, uh, the landscape architect, or architect and educator Gail Fulton picked up on this essential question of what comes next. And he says that she, meaning Zerniak, goes on to provide her answer, which is to focus passionately, not simply on what to do, but how to get it done. And here, he turns to the first category of the book, which is leave it and do nothing, um, uh, and argues that this opens the door to what would be a fascinating and much needed study of interventions that tend towards doing nothing, so it's not a proposal to do nothing the fast, cheap, and out-of-control strategies and tactics that landscape architects should wield, along with the slow, expensive, and intensely managed approaches that have traditionally dominated practice. And so perhaps to unpack these notions of how to engage, uh, to govern, and to design differently, for me, it's the last category on form property um, that provides some clues uh, that has nine ideas within it that are actions, so they are Clear it, fence it, grade it, oops, um, connect it, swap it, bank it, uh, and entrust it. And I'm going to stop on entrust it, um, and we'll perhaps continue this conversation about land trust. Um, they address a core challenge of abandonment, its messiness that often hinders implementation. There's rarely a clear title to clean, flat, and assembled land, or significant economic and political supports hard to secure, and the potential for return on investments unclear. So the risk is too high for a traditional uh, development model. So there's a need for a different formulation of property and development, both conceptually and physically, through changes in tenure, regulation, and ownership structure. Uh, through a pair of entwined cases, I'm going to turn here to Boston, because Boston is where I am, I am located, and um, I, I think a context that I can speak to uh, more, more um, responsibly. And in the second part of the talk, um, articulate a need for long-term leases, conservation measures, cooperative ownership structures, and government action. Uh, these uh, cases investigate um, the classic responses, so perhaps the garden, and the wild, and explore the way that these land uses have embedded themselves into the urban fabric over the last 40-some years. Um, so here's the wild. Uh, it's going to be, again, through a case study of the Boston Urban Wilds program, mainly, whose scattered sites appear here in green, uh, with a side glance toward the community gardens of Lower Roxbury and the South End, which are in orange. You probably can't even see them, but they're there. Um, Sites that have been actively guarded since the Boston Redevelopment Authority seized ownership and control of vacant parcels during urban renewal in the 1960s, and state legislator Mel King proposed a bill which passed in the mid-1970s allowing people to garden these fallow sites. Ownership was subsequently passed to the tenders through the South End Lower Roxbury Land Trust, which was later absorbed into the Boston Natural Areas Network, 
and finally into the trustees of the reservation. And there's more on this to come. But I chose these examples to illustrate um, ex uh, lasting examples of cooperative ownership, partnership, and action. So if the gardens trace their naissance to 1960s urban renewal, the wilds stem from a 1970s preoccupation of environmental concern, sharing a moment with the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. A young landscape architect employed by the Boston Redevelopment Authority, to this day they continue to have one landscape architect, um, Elliot Roadsides, he was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and an Ian McCarg trainee, was inspired by some of the conservation and land trust work happening in San Francisco and struck by the rocky outcroppings and tree stands of body Boston's idiosyncratic landscapes. He called these wild spaces precious, unprotected natural areas of remarkable beauty. This is highly debatable. Um, remaining hidden among the development areas, but for him, they represent a historical picture of Boston much older than the revolution. And so with his excitement, he applied for and received a Green Cities grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, one of those tiny little specks of money, um, to identify and catalog these spaces. So this is an image of the catalog from 1976 with the classic urban wild shot of a marsh, in this case, Belle Isle Marsh in the foreground, and an urban skyline in the background. He found, named, and geolocated 143 sites, setting the seeds for a decades-long conservation project. Um, Elliot le uh, Roadside left to start his own practice, um, and his team dispersed. And so the work of making this happen um, became the work of the Boston Natural Areas Fund, which was formed to continue this work where there are two individuals a sort of political genius named Eugenie Beale and an environmental planner named John Blackwell, who would later marry. Um, they spearheaded this collective effort to uh, protect the sites through easements and ownership transfers. And while some of the wilds were tamed, many found adoption. So this map on the side sort of charts uh, the changes with time. And um, these maps show the sites relative to vacancy and also relative to their complex ownership structure as a whole. And I just wanted to say another thing, that it, it does seem odd, perhaps in the context of this conference, to be talking about Boston. Um, but I think Boston in the 1970s was a very different city um, than it is today. And so it's interesting to look back to the past as you sort of project uh, forward to the future. So it was a place of population loss, of high levels of vacancy, um, of heavy disinvestment, especially in the areas that are located near the wilds and the gardens. And so I'm kind of interested in this broader context, but I'm also interested in the ownership and governance structure regarding the particular sites. Um, and it has a particular history, landscape architectural history in Boston, um, where perhaps the collective is more feasible. Uh, and so I, I, to illustrate this, I, I tried to make this kind of quick diagram for you guys, um, a sort of literal agents and agency diagram that shows the relationship between public parks agencies, um, and if you sort of start in the 1890s, uh, with the Metropolitan Parks Commission and the Boston Parks Department, which are governmental agencies, for example, and these not-for-profit land uh, trusts. And so it starts in the 1890s when the region is establishing a metropolitan park system of both publicly owned properties and those deeded to the not-for-profit trustees of the reservation to hold as a public resource. Okay. The idea is both of a metropolitan uh, park system and a not-for-profit land trust. Um, so it's kind of the first of these in the world. And it's an idea that's put forth by a landscape architect, Charles Elliott, and a journalist, Sylvester Baxter. And they basically imagine and invent a process whereby private landowners can give their estates uh, to the trustees to hold and maintain them for public good. And so it is a project of landscape architecture to kind of imagine and invent these sort of structures. If we um, fast forward to the 1970s, uh, the Boston Natural Areas uh, Network Fund that I uh, mentioned and, uh, is formed, and it's negotiating these conservation easements on private land and transfers to public land specifically for the urban wilds. And it set up a relationship between this not-for-profit advocacy group and a set of public agencies, including the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, a descendant of the, Massachusetts, uh, the Metropolitan Parks Commission, the Parks Department, and the Boston Conservation Commission, which is also comes into being around this time. And then we fast forward again today to where the Boston Natural Areas Network and its sites, including the gardens and the wilds, merges with the trustees of the reservation uh, and so basically you have these uh, sites of abuse, abandonment, and fallowness, joining an inventory of former estates. Um, 
of the advantage, and in a way, some of those states have also gone through periods of abandonment and wildness themselves. So you're kind of bringing together these places with very different tenure. I don't really have time, I think, um, but I wanted to look at just one site, uh, which is the Bussy Brook Meadow. It's an inland wetland with a kind of 400-year history um, that sits adjacent to Harvard's Arnold Arboretum and the MBTA forest. And to kind of, in the, in the desire for um, specificity and micro-narratives, to uncover the history of this, it basically is this working document um, talking about a transformation from a peaty brookside wetland to a drained, uh, dry farmland pasture, to a site that's crossed with rails and sewers, uh, to a site with a large stormwater impoundment pond to alleviate funding. It's a victory garden. It's a landfill. Uh, it's a site of many horrific drownings in, those, in that pond, which necessitates more landfilling. Um, yeah. And in the end, the site goes from a common marsh to a singularly owned farming estate to a parcelized fallow land that's a literal dumping ground for its multiple institutional and governmental owners. You can sort of draw it out here, um, so you can take that history and, and look at the, and the transformation of the land. Um, and at the same time, it becomes the poster child for the Boston Natural Areas Network protection. And so John Blackwell worked tirelessly for around two decades to protect this wild. He writes here in 1990 to the director of the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard about his love for the site and its importance within the city. And he reacts here to the Arboretum science and staff general distaste for this site and their reticence to fully adopt and steward the landscape. Simply put, they own it, but they do not understand its value. Um, and so it's this piece of land that's uh, owned by the city, the MBTA, and, and uh, the Arboretum that Blackwell continues to push and broker for a negotiation of, a tr of protection and property transfer that he basically succeeds in 1995, um, which is another two years after this is agreed. And the 24 acres are incorporated into the 1882 indenture for the Arboretum, which itself is an interesting agreement. Um, and so the site, as of the Arboretum itself, is owned by the city of Boston and leased in perpetuity to, the, to Harvard and the Arnold Arboretum to use as a site for research as well as a public park. Um, and so here you see Blackwell, uh, with Eugenie Beale and with Ma Mayor Menino. And Blackwell was always wary of uh, Harvard's intentions to keep it public. So he also started another uh, oversight agency to hold this institution accountable for its public uh, mission. So meanwhile, the Bussy Brook Meadow, once seen as a burden for um, this institution with an already unwieldy living collection to manage, has become actually a site of research and this time a site of research for urban ecology. And so while the site um, access is designed and intentional and public safety is maintained, otherwise the flora and fauna are allowed to grow, to succeed, to be successional, and to be wild, and uh, to sort of vary intentionally, seasonally as a result. Um, it's an idea that remains contested. Here it's contested by the manager of the urban wilds for the Boston Parks Department and by Elliot Roadsides, uh, who um, started the initiative in 1976, who are ruining the invasive species found here, who dream of some kind of eradication rather than accept those species um, that have arrived through fostered immigration, sometimes supported directly by the Arboretum's practice. We've invited these species, and as this in case indicates, we now have to find ways to live and design with them. Okay, to end and to not go over too much more. Um, I wanted to circle back to the Elliott and Baxter plan for the Metropolitan Park System, here overlaid with the wilds and gardens, to argue um, for the need for, des uh, for design, um, to invent a, a physical response and a physical space, but also governance models. Um, not to imply that we should emulate the past, because we obviously live in a very different world, but to take inspiration in the fact that we can invent new modes of action, as we've started to see today. Um, and to kind of reinforce the potential for cooperative land ownership and management structures to alter our attitudes towards the fallow landscape. They require long negotiations and even forced engagement to ensure a lasting public good. 
So the coffers of abandoned land are sometimes referred to as a contemporary commons, but they rarely operate in one, as one. Instead, they are commons in limbo, but what if we took measures to structure our models of property to ensure the management of a shared and equitable public realm that allows for the evolution of urban structure? To me, in, in asking what's the way forward, this points to a way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah. Jan and Anya, uh, I think we've had you know, just three extraordinary papers, uh, not, you know, in many ways not really about the land so much as the response that this uh, challenge of emptying, I mean, who would think that Boston in some ways in the, in the 60s and 70s had the same problems as Detroit, as Detroit today? So. Uh, there's, you know, I think a whole lot to, uh, to think about, to, to, to ask about. So, uh, in our uh, uh, communal search for knowledge, uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like you just to spontaneously turn to your neighbors uh, and, you know, in groups of three or four, uh, come up with a question that you'd like to present to, you know, to, to the audience. Uh, we'll take, say, three minutes, four minutes to do this, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be asking, again, following Lester Spence's innovations, to uh, uh, present to the panel uh, three questions at once so we can get as many of the questions as possible onto the floor. So please uh, spontaneously organize yourself as we should, as we, as we should and I'll come back to uh, the groups for their questions. All right, we're going to answer yeah. questions. Okay. okay, so if, if I can uh, inter interrupt these very lively discussions, uh, I, hope, I hope you're ready to, uh, uh, to, pre to, present, some, to present some questions. And uh, in, in uh, uh, follow following the uh, principle of the egalitarian metropolis, I'll try to call on people who, uh, who we haven't called on before, starting perhaps with, with a group at the back, with groups at the back. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Joe, could you, could you uh, identify yourself? And we'll be taking three questions uh, and then going back to the panel. Yeah, Joe, Joe Nasser, visiting from Toronto. Uh, just re reflecting of the two at the two uh, sessions before uh, uh, reminded me, uh, last year I was a, at an interesting conference in Beirut that was called The Place That Remains, uh, that dealt with these leftover or vestigial spaces, both inside the city as well as the entire watershed. So, uh, and thinking about perhaps, I don't know, my sense of maybe some contradictions or some oppositions that I can see. Uh, and thinking of production of decline as something that's actively produced at the role of different actors, whether it's speculators or, or nonprofit organizations in trying to take action. And then in this afternoon, we heard much more about leftover, about a fellow, about you know, the idea of stability, I mean, the spaces as, as stable spaces and what to do to kind of maintain them and this kind of, um, General, just any reaction to this, is uh, perhaps a position or contradiction that may exist in relation to agency and non-acting, -act non-acting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have a, do we have a, uh, questions over, over here? Or, no? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Hi there, uh, I'm Jeffrey Toon. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that kind of begins perhaps uh, with a question for Anya Sirota, but I wonder if it could be expanded to others. It, it goes, comes from a kind of being intrigued by the kind of guerrilla tactics utilized to assemble one's own micro land trust operation in the gaming of the um, auction system that you spoke about for assembling lands for Oakland Avenue Farms. And I guess my question has to do, what are the kind of, how do you see the scalar limits to that kind of operation? Is it a multiplicity of micro guerrilla activities? Is it a thing that can scale in terms of fiscal dimensions or spatial dimensions? And how might such tactics help advance some of the issues that were addressed in this panel? A third question. 
must be a, there must, must be a third question. Here are you. Okay. Yeah. Ila Berman uh, from UVA. I, I am fascinated with all of the tactics and strategies uh, that have been used or that you've been using in different contexts, whether it's documenting what happened in the rural area or um, uh, looking at specific opportunities, uh, let's say, within Detroit. And what's interesting to me that in spite of all of the visualizations uh, that are part of the process, um, that nobody's putting forward the guide to, right, so that someone else can take that strategy uh, and use it. And, I'm, and that's the question I have is, who are the people that would have to come to the table uh, to make some of these processes uh, replicable as a way of establishing another kind of agency, uh, whether it's agency within the design disciplines, within the communities, uh, with government, et cetera. So, uh, I hope <laughs> I hope uh, each of you is is ready to take on at least one at least one <laughs> of the one of the uh, Anya, would you mind beginning? Sure. If I could address this question first about replicability and then go to the scale question after. Um, it's amazing the number of how-to guides that actually already exist. They precede us by the dozens. And in fact, there are dozens of organizations that guide and advocate for the production of these kinds of spaces and uh, common landscape uh, opportunities. What's interesting to me is that how difficult it is to follow the guidebooks and to follow the guidelines and how every instance has its own particular cultural um, conditions, its own aggregate, uh, aggregate of people that have their own preoccupations and aspirations. And I think that the, 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 the moment where some of the guidebooks break down is when we get closest to making this an operating landscape and we recognize that the folks involved, they're, they're humans too, and we all live in a capitalist regime. And once we get very, very close to an operating system, we often fall back to a more normative uh, desire to own property. And I think it's just, um, there's, a, there's a process that has been designed. Uh, there's a materialization of those utopian aspirations that are very, very difficult uh, to get to, uh, especially when there are very challenging economic conditions uh, that everyone individually is uh, grappling with. So yeah, not for a dearth of uh, guidelines <laughs> to, to, to realizing it. But the scalar question is, is really interesting uh, also. Um, I, I think we started in our practice from a series of guerrilla activities uh, to test the possibility of coming to some kind of a, a value-added proposition in a design space. We're finding that as we work in very normative urban scenarios, like the Detroit uh, Cultural Center Planning Project, um, we're using many of the same negotiations and techniques to bring everyone to the table and to uh, figure out what could be shared, what could be traded, uh, and what kind of operations might work to get everyone to believe in a common good. And so, we're finding actually that it's all very much the same and um, some of the things that we thought were so radical are clearly not. <laughs> maybe, looking, maybe looking from, uh, from the rural point of view, um, there, are, there is a bunch of initiatives in most of the quotas of the area existing. And what probably is the experience is that there are not enough translators or transmitters that would bring their, well, their needs, but also their, their resources towards, uh, towards the processes which are uh, actually happening on the, on the higher level. Um, so, um, why, why I believe that, that the discourse around the uh, cultural capital actually was was very crucial one uh, was that is that 
it was not only about the hardware, so you didn't change the spatial system, but you were discussing or fighting for how actually this is interpreted and how it is used. So this is something where people come up not only with the skills to you know, redesign or, or they, they pos their own possibilities to invest, but they come with their own imaginations, feelings, or their life, and they, they can kind of present their ideas. And they can also see that, um, that or they can better feel whether they are represented on what this is happening in terms of cultural events or reinterpretation of a space. Um, so mediators who actually are, have evolved on that are very well qualified actually, but they are not those, like the urbanists, they are actually not those who are doing the, um, who are the real actors at, at the lower level. They are just the transmitters in a way. Um, and it took quite a long time to, to get this. Um, also because, um, uh, because the voices that were coming from bottom up were not so coordinated. So it needed really a kind of time and, and, uh, and this, this big, big discourse. So um, who is to bring to the table? I believe uh, this is both with the transmitters. And um, the question is how to, how to get among different topics which are, which are actually evolving in these particular neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have um, clear answers to anyone's questions, but um, I think to the question of scale, the thing I always still think about, and maybe it's just my own disciplinary foundation, but is, is also a question of time, and um, I think we're always looking for an immediate answer to something, and I think what I've tried to to kind of think about in these case studies is that, well, really it took, you know, 40 years for this to happen, but what are the sort of... In, immediate steps that, that, that you could take to do something and, that, and imagine someone that you're actually designing a 40-year, not a project for 40 years, but like a current project that, that has a kind of long durée. And so I think, um, you know, maybe at the, at the micro scale you can imagine a how-to guide or something that's immediately actionable, but if you're trying to think about a, a larger systemic problem that it's like, you, you have to force yourself out of these short-term evaluations, these, I don't know, fiscal cycles or census cycles or things where we measure, where we measure success on such a micro, um, micro time scale. Um, and then I guess um, the other thing, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, I, I, I'm always arguing in a way for a, some kind of generic specific or something. Like to me, I can't really operate if I'm not thinking about something specific, but once I do that, I think, there's so many, like, is that the right answer for this particular place? Like, I think I need a longer engagement with something to understand that. So how do you, how do you actually uncover the, the, the variety but, not, but actually give it, give it to someone to kind of adapt to their to local conditions? So I feel like the how-to guide, it falls, it falls I, I'm not in the position. I can imagine a kind of vision. I can think about how you, add val how you um, create different value propositions for something that might allow some of these projects to happen, but I don't know that I can actually, without a huge team of people and a longer engagement, say how you actually make that happen. Is that fair? Uh, I'm going to be going, going back to the floor for, for a second, but in a second, but uh, I can't. Even though I'm not a group, I can't resist inserting a, 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 question, a question for the for the panel. And you know, Jill's last slide, uh, you know, it was a kind of adaptation of of the Charles Eliot plan for uh, for Bo uh, for Boston metro area, 1893, I think. And one of the things that I was thinking about that is that. What gave, you know, what brought people to the table was that it was not just about open space, you know, it was about water and water quality and water purity. And it said, you know, it was a moment in Boston's history where, you know, Eliot was saying, you know, if we don't get together, uh, you know, we're going to die of these diseases. Uh, so there was uh, an urgency, you know, behind the Eliot plan, I think, that that overcame a lot of the divisions and re reluctance. So well, I guess I, 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 would, I would challenge the, the panel in terms of, 
what are the combinations, you might say, or the meanings of urban land and so on that might give an urgency to, this, to these issues? But I think we do have that. I mean, we still ha have that urgency in a way. I mean, to the question of like, there were protests about clean water as a, or like a lead decontamination or, I mean, I feel like there are plenty of perhaps crises we could um, rally behind at this particular moment that might provide us with an, like a similar level of urgency to do, to do something. Yeah, I, I, I would combine this question also with the question that we didn't quite address, which is about the slow-cooked nature or um, the, the leftover or laissez-faire nature of some of the propositions in this panel and the sense of urgency simultaneously that uh, inhabits these landscapes. Um, I would first address the, this question by saying that uh, they're in, those, these landscapes are in constant transformation because they are a capital asset. So every day, their value is in fluctuation. And every day, there's the possibility of purchasing, repurchasing, bundling, and um, the evisceration of neighborhoods and the last vestiges of uh, the tradition of people living in particular contexts for a particular value. And so there is a, a pressing need to, to reevaluate um, how those uh, transitional spaces are valued and how they could be brought together and bundled and recreate the, the civic ethos that could once produce a collective plan and a collective agenda. But um, you know, in many ways, I, we, we often in our practice don't consider these contexts as post-industrial contexts, but post-democratic. And the, the real problem for us is um, not so much the, the, the quality of the land or the value of the land, but the difficulty in participating in its future projection when the very uh, fabric by which decisions are made have been, has been deconstructed to such an, uh, an extent. So just for us, we always remember that the 2016 elections brought 16% of Detroit uh, to the polls. And with that kind of um, post-democratic scenario, the idea of having a generous master plan becomes highly problematic even though the urgency to produce one is greater than ever. I would probably state that um, uh, it, is quite, it became quite difficult to uh, identify one trigger which is actually triggering action. So if we would say this is the water or this is the land or this is the poverty or this is what we are experiencing now, it's a kind of uh, speeding up and, and combination of, of factors which are actually pushing us into a very fluid concept of, uh, of using and conceptualizing the space. So um, the crucial point probably is to create a system of fast reaction and adaptability which would allow us actually to deal simultaneously with many triggers and the question is how we can translate it into a built environment or environment for life. We have time for one question. Yeah, okay, so yes, here's, here's a, a question here. So my, my name is Christa Reicher. I'm from the Aachen University. We discussed about the Ruhr region, but I just want to give a, a comment what these panels make uh, this panel made clear that uh, landscape and the built-up structure, they are working really closely to each other. And this is not new. This, if you see the re uh, regional context of the rural region, you see it since more than 100 years that the region is structured by the nature and the nature is structuring the built-up um, environment. This was also one finding. And the other finding is that uh, decline stagnation and growing, growth is really close to each other. Five years ago in the rural region, we were discussing about decline. Now all the big cities are growing. And the question of the mayors of the rural region is, do we need these green backbones? Or should we create 
areas for these new and incoming people and new housing. So, this conflict, I ask myself all the time, do we learn something as planners, as political authorities, um, in a time where we are uh, discussing about climate change and so on? So we are always repeating the same faults. And the problem of the rural region is not that we have no convincing plan, but we have a competition between 51 cities, and every city, city wants to have area for urban extension, yes. even if there is enough uh, brownfield within the city. So I ask myself, what does this mean for our uh, discipline? Do we ne need something in between, between planners and landscape architects? Do we need an intermediate, um, let's say, institution between the political decision makers and these planning experts, or what do we need? S sometimes I have the feeling we are repeating our faults since more than 100 years. This was our discussion we had in this small working group. Yeah, that was a good, that was a good Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so we, we are, good. we are time. I, just, I only hope that Detroit has this problem soon. <laughs> okay, well thank you. Let's thank you. the panel for a wonderful presentation.